those who choose to watch the service at a different time based on a variety of reasons. We're mindful of this. We value our online church, our virtual church. Last Sunday, our worship service in Dent had 28 people in it. Here in Virgus, we had 21, but we had 28 people online. They are a church unto themselves, and to ignore that would be to our detriment. So welcome to our time of worship. And we know there's a variety of reasons why people might watch us at different times. They might have work conflicts. They might not be feeling well. They could have mobility issues that keep them at home. And so we, we just acknowledge that. We're aware things have changed with this pandemic. We're much more mindful of a variety of ways people are engaging with us in worship. They may be staying away because this pandemic is not gone. They may be doing certain things to care for their health. And we welcome them this morning. Let us welcome them and worship the living God together and this encouraging word that we're going to engage with. You know, if you're blessed by our streamlined service and encouraged, feel free to pass it on to your friends that they might be encouraged, that they might know the love that God has for them. Whether you're online or in person now, we transition to giving, our offering, uh, our tithes and offerings. This is the high point of our worship service because not only do we acknowledge the finances that God has blessed us with, we also acknowledge that all of who we are belongs to God. So let us uh, engage with that giving and we encourage you to give generously. And I'm going to mention this. I don't always get a chance to do this. But one reason you might want to give generously is sometimes we find out that there are families within our church system that are struggling, that they're, they're facing some difficulty. And when we can give generously, when we have extra money to give, this allows us to extend the love of God, maybe through uh, gift cards from the grocery store or uh, gift cards from our local restaurant. We keep it local. We keep it local. But we want to extend the love of God to help them through that rough patch. So that is one reason for us to give generously this morning. And, and then now allow me to pray for the offering. Generous God, our well of life and never-ending source of living water, we call upon your name. Grant us wisdom to know you more completely and hearts and wills that thirst and hunger for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. As we give our gifts and our tithes today, we recommit ourselves to your service, O oh God. We recommit ourselves to the service of your people and your world. We pray this now, Lord, as followers of the glorified Christ. Amen. Please rise as we engage in humming the doxology. Samaria called Char, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the, 
who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his, also his sons and his livestock? <clears throat> Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become uh, in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Do you recognize this song? talking about whiskey and beer again. So are you familiar with that song? Oh my gosh, I am not a big country western fan, but I remember this song when it came out. It was a big deal. It won awards. It was a big deal. And I've had fun with it this week. I've been humming it and singing it. Oh my word. And then when he, when he starts to talk about the whiskey and beer, I had to shut it down. And, and when I was in Dent, I said, you know, maybe we should stay clear of this. But I, I mentioned to Dent, I said, you just need to know that I grew up with a brother wearing a t-shirt that said, I got bent in Dent. <laughs> so you guys have been corrupting me since grade school, and I never knew the Lord would direct my steps to be ministering to you in my adult life. So I don't think we have to be too worried about the lyrics. So the song, we got this guy. He's, he's maybe grew up blue collar. He prefers jeans, no need to impress or dress for success. One line he says that I really liked, I'm not big on social graces because I've got friends in low places. A person who doesn't fit into high society, a bit of an outcast which makes me think of another outcast, another man who didn't fit in. He was trained uh, as a carpenter, but born a king. And all through Lent, we have been looking at Jesus' ministry life in detail as we follow in his footsteps to the cross. And now, today, we will be looking at the kind of people Jesus preferred to hang out with. The kind of people Jesus held the door open wide of the kingdom to. Truly, these people were truly welcome in the kingdom of God. And the people that Jesus spent most of his time with, those he touched with hugs and handshakes and healed and laughed with and ate with, they were often described in derogatory terms, such as outcast sinner, or the poor. He spent so much time with the outcasts, the sinners, and the poor. He spent so much time with them that he was frequently and harshly criticized for it. The Pharisees criticized him, ridiculed him in front of his disciples when the Pharisees turned to the disciples in Matthew 9 and said, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners. Later in Matthew 11, the religious leaders, they just don't give it up. They're not done. They keep doing it. 
They shout and they point to shame and smear Jesus' reputation when they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Not a good breed. That wasn't a good group of people. Jesus broke bread with, with the rich and the poor alike. But it was often the rich and the religious elite who were uh, uh, offended by Jesus, while sinners were drawn to him in droves. I told you I've, I've enjoyed Garth Brooks' song all week. Because I am rural. I was born rural. My heart is rural. And I, I would av avoid, just like Garth Brooks' song, I would avoid a black tie affair and wear jeans if I could. But then it wouldn't be a black tie event anymore, right? Like, that doesn't work. But um, that's just not how I'm wired, and I'm guessing that's not how you are wired either. We are rural, and we are small town, and it is just fine. Jesus spent most of his time in small towns, rural settings, and he only went to the big city Jerusalem once a year for Passover, and when he had to do big uh, you know, the last week of his life, he headed back to Jerusalem. He was rural. He was small town. And he was just fine with that. So it makes sense for us this morning to look at a woman and to study the story of a woman who is also rural in small town. And she actually fits the bill for all three of those derogatory terms. She was certainly treated like an outcast. She was called a sinner. And she was poor in a couple of ways, but there, she's poor in one way that is unique, and it made all the difference. All the difference. It's a simple story. Jesus and his disciples are walking from Jerusalem to Galilee. Jesus de decides to take the straightest route between two points as a straight line right through Samaria. It was at the hottest part of the day, he was tired and he was hungry, and he rests at Jacob's well, waiting for his disciples to return with lunch. And while resting, a Samaritan woman arrives to draw water, and he asks her for a drink of water from her water jar. Simple story. <laughs> this is not a simple story. There's nothing simple when we talk about Jesus. First, Samaritans were an ethnic group that were despised by the Jews. Absolutely despised. They were Jews that at one point were pure. But in the time of Jesus, in the 800 years before Jesus' life, these Jews had begun to intermarry with the Assyrians. And so they did not keep their ethnicity pure. And though they copied many of the Jewish traditions, many of the Jewish uh, religious attributes, there was things that they added or changed that also made them un, uh, considered unpure in the eyes of the Jews. They were called people of the land, which on our ears doesn't sound so bad, but in those days that was a slur. They were half-breeds. They were lower than the Jews. The Jews considered them a lower than them. They were people of low places. The Samaritans, one of the things that they did was that they had been blocked from the temple worship in Jerusalem. And so they had to come up with a different way that they could worship. And they identified that they would worship on their own mountain, Mount Gerizim, 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 I don't know. Um, good luck with that. Gerizim, we'll just go with that, right? And so they worshipped on their own mountain. And they were so looked down upon, we have to repeat this, that no self-respecting Jew would walk through Samaria. They would add days to their route to avoid walking and having to talk or discuss or see or even look at the Samaritans. So this woman, who is never identified by name, and this is a huge passage in chapter 4 of John, uh, she, as being a Samaritan woman, 
Um, first, we just go with Samaritan. She is ethnically and religiously an outcast, automatically. Just, you can just check the boxes on that right away. And then as for being a woman, when Jesus asked her for water from her, you know, from her water jar, he was not only crossing social boundaries of ethnicity and religion, but he was also crossing strict gender boundaries. One article I read noted that in Jesus' world, in Jesus' time, men rarely spoke to women in public, even if they were married to them. Oh my gosh. So this thing that Jesus did in asking for a drink of water from her cup was a social no-no. And she notes the breach of etiquette with Jesus. She notes that out loud. You are asking as a Jew, me a Samaritan woman for water. So there's two strikes against her. She's a Samaritan and she's a woman. It marks her as an outcast. But there is maybe another telling detail that could maybe further uh, mark her as an outcast in her culture. It was noon when she arrived at the well to draw water. And she would have arrived at the well all by herself if Jesus hadn't been there waiting for her to come. Typically in that culture, women would gather water in the cool of the day, in the morning. They would gather in the morning and then they would fellowship and gossip around the well, like the, the water fountain in offices, right? Our modern day equivalency. But scholars comment on this time, it was hard to know for sure what was going on here for her. Had her reputation, which we'll talk about in a little bit, had her reputation preceded her, had they given her the cold shoulder and rejected her? Did they, did they push her away so that she only wanted to come when no one else was at the well? It's hard to say. Maybe this is another place of being considered an outcast from her own culture, religion, and now even her own gender maybe was pushing her away. In the next five verses of the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, Jesus begins to talk to her about offering her living water, water of a different kind, providing spiritual refreshment and eternal life. She doesn't immediately get this. Uh, she doesn't get this metaphor that Jesus is extending to her, partly because I think being at the well, the physical and concrete object lesson was just too big. It was overpowering the spiritual metaphor that Jesus was trying to engage with her around. She just, actually, she just wants the actual water. Give me the water so I don't have to keep coming back here every day. But it's at this point that the story gets really weird. It takes a sharp turn. It gets crazy. And we didn't get a chance to read this, so I'm just going to kind of talk us through. So this is where she says, give me this water. And then Jesus, looking at her very calmly and directly, says, go call your husband and come back. Well, I'm sure there was an awkward pause on her part. And when she acknowledges, I don't have a husband, Jesus responds, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you are with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Whoa, <laughs> gulp, what just happened there? A complete stranger had just summarized the private details of her life in like a simple sentence. Now her past is uncovered. Her reputation is revealed. She has been married and divorced five times, and the man she is with is currently not her husband. Was this what made her an outcast in her town? This shame. You know, if Samaritans were considered the lowest of the low, she was probably considered the lowest of the low among the Samaritans. And I'm convinced between my drive, between Dent and here, that if there had been a lower person in the town, Jesus would have talked to that person. This is probably the lowest 
person in the whole town. And this is where most article scholars, sermons that I look at, begin to emphasize her divorces and use the term sinner. That is a lot of divorces. I mean, let's, I mean, five divorces. My dad had a friend who had been divorced seven times. And I really just wanted to tell that guy, give it up. You are not made to be married. Stop it. I mean, really, that's crazy. So five husbands living with a man. But is sinner the right term to attribute to her? Is it fair? More historical and cultural research has been done around this time. And a different way to look at her life situation, her life circumstances, and her experiences has been uncovered. And I think it's actually, it rings true to her experience, her engagement with Jesus at the well, and, and how Jesus treated her and how her town treated her, how her town responded to her, but we'll get to that in a minute. And personally, I have to admit, I know I have a chip on my shoulder. I do not do well when there are storylines in which the woman is the villain that needs to be fixed. She's the problem that needs to be fixed. I do not do well with that. But I'm in good company because Jesus did not do it well with towns that oppressed women either. Think on it. This is not a chance encounter. This is not a coincidence. Jesus was intentional. He specifically came to her town at a specific time in the day. He sent all the disciples away. I know they're men, but you don't need 12 men to go get lunch right? He sends all the disciples to go get lunch so that he can have this important conversation with this woman. She might not even have come to the well had there been more men. He knew she was coming. He waited for her to come. He knew the exact well that she would come to. He knew exactly what he was doing when he asked her for a cup of water. Jesus was on a specific mission of love. With new cultural research, women of this time, now it's being uncovered for us, women of this time often had multiple husbands. They had multiple divorces because they would often marry young, really young. And their husbands were often much older. So you could go through two or three husbands in your lifetime. Easy. I know it would be easy for me because I know how I cook. And it wouldn't take much to go through quite a few men at that point. And getting a divorce, though it was a stigma for women, was easy for a man to do. He just filled out a little piece of paper, sent the woman on her way. But it was close to impossible for a woman to initiate divorce. So was she a horrible sinner? Jesus never said so. On numerous occasions, in many stories throughout the New Testament, Jesus would tell someone, your sins are forgiven, or go and sin no more. But in this situation, he doesn't raise that. He doesn't bring that up. He doesn't rebuke her when he reveals to her her past and her present living situation. And later, when she goes back into town to tell them about Jesus, the way the town responds is also uh, telling. Because if she had been this huge sinner, if she had been this like a horrible character, they would have never listened to her. They would have never responded to her. They would have never gone out to the well to find their Messiah. Because would a Messiah speak to such a horrible sinner? This just would have not computed. But what about her being poor? Outcast, sinner, poor. The poor were the third kind of category of persons that Jesus loved and hung around with and thoroughly enjoyed. It's obvious that a woman of that time period who was not married, she was so poor and so dependent that she had to stay with a man simply to have a roof over her head and food to eat. So yes, she was poor. But she is poor in another sense too. 
She is poor in a way that actually touches, could maybe possibly touch our lives today. There is possibly a place of overlap and connection for us. Her story can connect to our lives. What kind of poverty am I referring to? That poverty was the poverty of the soul. She had a spiritual thirst and hunger. She was hungry to know the Messiah and wanted to worship him when he came. She wanted that life-giving water that he was talking to her about. Later in their discussion that we didn't get to cover, but later in their discussion, they start to engage in deep theological concepts. She wants this man's opinion, which now she's convinced this is more than an ordinary man. This is, this is a prophet. He has told me things about my life that he shouldn't know. So this is a prophet. I want to get his opinion about where I should worship. Should I worship on Mount Gerizim or at the temple in Jerusalem? But even before Jesus can respond, she just kind of says, no, that's okay. Because when the Messiah comes, the Messiah is coming. When the Messiah comes, he's going to make this all clear for me. And this is a beautiful part of this sp- the story. It's an amazing point in the story. It's so beautiful. It's at this point when she says, I'm just, you know, the, the Messiah will clear things up. It's at this point that Jesus openly reveals to her that he is the person that he's been waiting for. Pardon me. He reveals to her, I am that person you've been waiting for. I am the Messiah. This is the first time that he has shared that and revealed that to anybody in this Gospel of John. She is the first person that he, is, he does this to. And this woman, who has maybe only known rejection from men, is now receiving respect and dignity and life-giving water. Spiritual life. And the kind of love that will finally fill her heart and heal her soul. And part of the reason Jesus seeks her out and asks her for water, engages in a long conversation and where he reveals who he truly is, is because she has been so evidently hungry and thirsty for spiritual truth. She is spiritually thirsty for for the water only Jesus can give. And he sees that, and he hears that, and he responds. And this is the point in which there is crossover for us. This is where our story and her story could interconnect and overlap, depending on how we answer this question for ourselves. I am not Jesus, I cannot see into your heart. But this question, where are we in our own spiritual thirst and hunger? Are we willing to ignore, uh, acknowledge, rather, are we willing to acknowledge that we are poor without the life-giving water that Jesus gives? Are we spiritually thirsty enough to ask Jesus for living water? For a relationship with him. Jesus didn't care that she was an outcast or if she had sinned. Jesus didn't care if she was a small town rural girl. He preferred small town rural. Jesus didn't care that she was poor and dependent. He saw her thirst and he gave her life giving water. And then this is where Jesus flips this song by Garth Brooks. He flips it. And Jesus becomes her friend in the lowest places of her life. And the wonder of that. I continue to extend blessings upon your Lenten journey. And now as we transition to our next hymn, as I've been talking to pastors and as we, as, we, as we have wrestled with the humming, none of us like humming, but they have mentioned that sometimes what they do 
is read some of the lyrics out loud, and they have, they have heard back from their congregation that sometimes when they do that, the congregation kind of forgets some of the words in some of these hymns, and they're beginning to have like a deeper appreciation of the hymns that they're actually singing because they're coming to grips with those lyrics in a deeper way. So I just thought I'd read a couple of the choruses that we will not be humming. And as we think of the woman of the well, I think some of these choruses resonate beautifully. So allow me to read a couple of the choruses, and then we will rise and, and hum. But here's the song, verses 2 and 3 that we're not going to be doing. Near the cross, a trembling soul, love and mercy found me. There the bright morning star shed its beams around me. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow o'er me. Please rise as we hum our next hymn. go into that. God be with you. worship service that has given God glory and filled our spiritual cup has now ended. It has concluded, but our service to the world, our service in the name of Christ and sharing God's love has just begun. So receive the blessing so that you may be filled to overflowing to go and be a blessing. Let's receive the blessing, dear friends. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen and amen.
Thank you.